Watching the photocopy machine. Anita, uh, what happened? Uh, Bruno <laughs> dropped everything. They went everywhere. He's alive. He's not alive. Okay. Okay. Well. Okay. Sadly, we've got a one and a seven somehow. Oh wait. I'm lacking a one. Isn't it? You're lacking a one. Here's, here's one. Oh, sorry. Here's a one, two, a three, and a seven. You can have that. <laughs> okay, I'm going to keep this one, and who doesn't have one yet? Sorry. Do you have one? You, we stole one for you. Did you get it? Oh, they have it upstairs for you. Because yours meant to be with Beth, right? Yeah, Andre said you're 645. A Andrew, and Andre has your copy. Oh, I'm just saying. I didn't know. Okay, so you can... Spare four. You have a spare four. Excellent. Does anybody okay. need a four? Yeah. 
Okay. It raised me. That's right. <laughs> exactly right. Okay. Um, shall we turn the light off or no? Bruno, you have to turn the light on behind you. And then someone has to turn really could turn their light off. Now of this illustrious group who's sitting here, how many of you actually are taking the class? Okay. These people, <laughs> if you want to, you can sit at the table. Okay? Just so you know. If you don't want to sit at the table, you very, you like to sit at the table sometimes. Sometimes. Sometimes, but not today. <laughs> anyway, so all right, that's good. So now everyone else who's not taking the course for credit, if you plan to sit in longer than tonight, then you have to do the readings. And you have to make a commitment because you end up bonding in this class. Just the good news and the bad news. Um, so you need to be a part of the class, otherwise it becomes like a normal uh, educational experience, which you don't want, believe me, for those of you that have avoided it thus far by going to art school, you know, uh, right? <laughs> that's not meant as a dig, it's meant as an appreciation. Um, okay, some of you I, I've seen before, and many of you, I, or some of you haven't. So I'm gonna introduce myself. I'm going to then ask you to do the same. And uh, we're, gonna, we're also on uh, camera. We're being uh, filmed on the web. So uh, eventually we'll get the streaming down. This is taking a little bit of time. <laughs> What's that? Is that my job? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It, it shouldn't be that difficult. No, you can. We should be able to do it now. Now the technology is... I'll look into it. I'll yeah. Into it. Can you help them work on that? To do what? Just, just to stream it, live stream. Okay, it can't be that difficult. No, I should be able to solve this. Okay, we must be able to figure out how to live stream this. This is a media arts philosophy class and practice. Okay. So the first of all, the course is called Media Arts Philosophy Practice. It's an MA class. And it's actually a very high level MA class, which is the good news and it's also the bad news. So if you feel lost for the first, let's say, six out of the 10 weeks, that's normal. Um, there are two um, assignments, as it were, in, the, in, the, in this group. One is called an analytic book review, which is very much like for those of you who took the last term, you know what that's about. Uh, which does not mean I like the book, and then you know you say what you liked about it. It's it's figuring out what it's being what is being said. Now this is going to be slightly different because you don't necessarily have to do a book. You can pick anything out of this uh, out of the uh, essential versus important readings or viewings, and you can make a comment on that. So it doesn't it's just not completely wedded to a text as in a writing text. Though it turns out that's easier to do, believe it or not, than than the harder stuff like uh, images. Anyway, um, this course takes up where the other one left off, though you do not need to have taken the first one. How many people feel like they survived the first one? <laughs> uh, a couple survivors from the first one. <laughs> really, you didn't survive it? No, just like, that's it. The first class was on contemporary philosophy and aesthetics. And basically, it lays the groundwork for what is probably the most usual way in to understanding just about everything. Uh, and that's pretty much called dialectics, Hegelian dialectics in particular. And we looked at all different ways of understanding how something has a totalizing or a, a full unity to make sense of it. Uh, the shorter version of that is, if I claim something, how do you know what I'm saying is right? And not just because I'm in a position of authority. Yeah, come on in. Sorry to interrupt. Any idea where the talk is? I don't know. How do you find that? Do you know? It starts next week. Pardon? It starts next week. Oh, it starts next week? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Let's start again. In with anger, out of love. I always say that. And fab. Okay. Let's start again. Um, so the the question is, how do you know what is being said is not just your opinion, however fabulous your opinion might be? How do you know you're right? Now, you might just have a gut feeling, but how do you know your gut is right? And if you're not feeling well that day, how do you know if it's not performing, or it's doing something weird, or if you're on drugs or something? How do you know? How do you know it's correct? 
And you can get further with that. You can say, well, how do I know that, let's say, a liberal environment is better than a non-liberal environment? How do I want to make that claim? And if I really feel that way, do we go to war over this view? Or do we intervene in other countries because of it? And so on. You can really push it. Anyway, that's what we did last term, and we ended up on the question of Auschwitz, which was, for Christmas, really depressing, so I'm sorry about that. This time, we're going to do something very different. Um, there, as you know, because you're living in this time period, something really amazing is happening. By amazing, I don't necessarily mean good. I just mean amazing. And that is called uh, the information age, or the technological age, or whatever age you want to call this, uh, the media age digital transformation, somehow things that were seemingly obvious had a cause and effect, had two objects cannot occupy the same place at the same time, had a very specific sense of physics, would uh, now be tossed out in favor of basically quantum physics. So the reaction of quantum physics and then computing and then uh, genes, uh, genetic biologies, and morphogenesis, and all this kind of thing, artificial intelligence. This is rocketing our world. And, um, it, and it's also rocketing the you know, question of art and imagination and so on and so forth. So I give you this kind of general background in order to get back to um, introducing myself. My name is Professor Johnny Golding. I have a, my professorship, the chair is in philosophy and fine art contemporary philosophy. It was going to be philosophy, the wild sciences and fine art, but it was too long a thing. And now I think I'm just going to recap it back to just philosophy, because I just want to call that philosophy. But anyway, um, I went on a very odd trajectory to get here. I don't think you'd come to philosophy, or at least anyway, I certainly didn't come to philosophy thinking this was where I was headed. I was headed as a scientist, or not even that, I was into physics and then mathematics and then into sort of something with math-oriented things, economics. <coughs> Eventually, I got into politics. But everything came in sort of from coming in backwards to it, because I, I just thought you couldn't make any real sense of it. Then in, um, in, at one point, some of my friends who were involved with different leftist struggles in the States were killed in a, in a car bomb. It was the first time that it happened in the US, and it was shocking to me. Um, uh, I was, at, at that point I was working at the State Department. I was working under Kissinger, so you can imagine how surprising the whole thing was. And, um, and I might have mentioned this before to you, but I'm, I'm sorry if I have, but uh, one of the things that happened was that the group I was with, um, when they had the uh, church service going on, they said, um, you know, your job, Johnny, is to look in people's bags and see if they have a bomb. And I said to them, and what if they do? What do I tell them? Don't take it in. <laughs> Sorry. Leave the bomb aside. You know, no backup plan. I thought, that's really kind of amazing. So I left the US. I went to Canada. I decided I need to study about democracy. It's something I didn't understand. Um, and so there the journey began. From, from Toronto, I went to Cambridge and studied with Raymond Williams. And then I ended up becoming very embroiled in theater. I started directing on the London stage. I got completely involved in that. Then I decided that I had to be in an environment where I could do both art and philosophy and science. And then I went to the Netherlands, and then I came back here, and now I'm here. So that's more or less my trajectory. And I've written a lot of books. And I have, um, I'm, I'm even more than I ever was before convinced that the key to all of this, if there is a key, is curiosity. That is the bottom line. As long as you can maintain your curiosity, you'll never age. You won't do age. I don't do age. I don't know if anybody else does, but I don't do, I don't do age, I don't do gender, I don't do skin color, I don't do any of it. I'm bored with it all. I just am interested in these curiosity flavors. So that's not enough, though. And it's certainly not enough for me to teach you a class. And it's certainly not enough for you to take what you need as thieves, steal what you need, wear it, play with it, inhabit it. Otherwise, you'll never get it. It'll just be rude. And you'll just do no better than a lot of the other people that call themselves philosophers. You can see how I'm to do that. Um, OK, or you'll produce what I call bad art. That's your job.
to figure out how to do that, to get away from that. Okay, so that's me. I'm Johnny. You can call me Johnny. You can call me Professor Golding. I also uh, go by Sue Golding, which is my um, one of my many original names. Uh, and um, you can find me under either Sue Golding, Johnny Golding, Johnny DeFilo, Master Johnny Boy. I don't know what else I've gone under, but I, I'm written under a lot of pseudonyms, and that's many of them right there. Uh, think of me. Your turn. <laughs> Talk about your drawing. Talk about your. Oh, I do drawing on paper. Yeah, you don't just do drawing. What, what is this that you do? This I thing do. that you've done for 15 years <laughs> or something. I do very um, detailed. Yeah, it's very detailed, finely worked um, drawings with the paper almost spread thin. That kind of drawing. So you're interested in the way in which graphite hits the page. I'm interested in how the page. Back to you. Ah, okay. That's, That's very interesting. I mean, paper replies back to you when you say it's your on what it says back to you. And does it have a mind, the paper, do you think? As a whole. As a, as life. a whole. Has life, lives. a spirit. It has life. Okay. Mm. So, yeah. Do you think you'd get the same <coughs> reaction if you were doing it on an etch a sketch or a, or a computer? Because we don't know what an etch a sketch no. is. All right. No, um, I, I do. I love Etch-a-Sketch. You love Etch-a-Sketch? Yeah. Does everybody else know what Etch-a-Sketch is? Yeah. Wow. What happened to that light? <laughs> it's someone, getting moody. That's right. Is someone, is someone leaning on it? Possibly. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, thanks. Andrew, you're going to be banned from sitting in that section. <laughs> oh. It lives. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Your turn. And I'm Anna Carroll. I'm doing history of art and design full time. And I curate things and write. I'm interested in exhibition histories, criticism, things like that. Would you say that cur curating is kind of like shepherding? Um, like you have a bunch of like wild lambs running around. Yeah, and but also writing, I would say, is as well. And how do you view, do you view yourself as an artist curator or as a, someone who's like an organizer? I'm not very good at alternative. Artist. Millie? I'm, I'm nowhere near it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> that gives you the <laughs> reason for being very sure. guilty. <laughs> okay. And not as an artist curator, I don't think. Um, so I'm not sure about the making part of what I do. Maybe it's more of a taking than a making. Hmm. Um, <coughs> would you make your name as a curator? Would you see that there's curators who have a name? Yeah, yeah, and that's what I used to do. And then I got made redundant, and then I worked <laughs> in an office and lost myself a bit, and then came here. And huh? And so you were made into like an office slave of some kind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what made you think that I can get out of here? How, how did you realize you could leave it? Um, the, ex the exit. Um, I, don't, I don't know really. I just decided, and then everyone told me I was really brave, and then I thought, oh, I didn't think of it like that. I just did it. Oops. I just, just kind of did it and didn't think about it. Hmm. Good. So. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Who hasn't been here? You haven't been here before, right? So, what are their two names? You know? Do you remember? No. See, you can't be rehearsing what you're going to say. you got to re be listening to what they say. Sorry, there's a lot to embarrass you. No, I, I know what they said, I just can't remember names. <laughs> who can remember their names who don't know? Yes? Sarah. Annika. Annika. Good. Okay. See, this is how we end up bonding. See, how Kim Hilda says this will happen all the time. That's not quite true. It will happen all the time. I'm Natalia. Uh, just to confuse you, I'll give you my full name. Natalia Gennadyevna Zhurnokova Gasson. You only have to remember Natalia. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing MA Fine Art part time, and at the moment I'm not even certain what I am. Painter? Probably. Oh, I thought you meant like animal. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was really at a much that, lower that, that level. Was, yeah, I'm not quite certain what or who I am. So, painter or? Or painter. Okay, that uh, kind of narrows it down. Okay, so you're still thinking you're a painter. I'm yes, I'm level. still thinking what, what I'm a painter, but I'm thinking about it, yeah. Uh, it's a mystery book? at the moment. Do you know the book P is for painting? 
Yes. 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 Yeah, check it out. Vitamin P. Yeah, vitamin P. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sculpture, but I absolutely love anything, <laughs> any sort of process. I need to know. Um, but, um, when you say process, you're using your hands. So you yeah, process any, that. Any, and I, I get excited about to learn any sort of process that you bring me. I stop motion. I learned to do that last week. You know, just which can be a difficulty, but it's also it's that curiosity. Mm -hmm. um, but my work is uh, is about it's about human existence. Yeah. But I like to try and keep it light if you know I don't want you know, I don't don't I don't want to sort of pro you know, say PRA. Yeah, no. Yeah. As opposed to P R E Y. Yeah. So it would be also quite weird. Yeah. yeah. I think it's yeah, it's fine that's the yeah. Oh, okay. Good. Any questions for these three? Me. Yeah. I was interested in the curating. Because I did the, the CCP after the BA. And the CCP is what? Oh, so contemporary, sorry, contemporary <laughs> curatorial practice. Ah. Um, and I left it after the after Peter Sert. It wasn't, although I enjoyed bringing um, exhibitions on, actually, I wanted to find work. Sure. <laughs> um, but it was very, very useful. So ah. it was just, it was, you know, we were both artists. And, you know, no, I'm not really the artist. Yeah. I'm a, but I'm a writer, so maybe that is creative. Uh, I don't know. It's <laughs> one of those. I'm not really sure. It, it, it's making, so it must be yeah. art in some way. But okay. good. Okay. Uh, I'm Emma. So I'm on. You're the Emma. Yeah. You're the one that's been emailing me. Yeah. All right. Okay. Hi, Emma. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, no, it's all good. Okay. Um, I'm doing the MA Arts Practice and Education full time. Um, Do I hear an American accent? I'm Irish. Irish. That's what I thought. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's throwing out. Um, I came, I did the BA in Art and Design in Bourneville for one year and I did three years in Ireland. So yeah, I came from Bourneville to here. So. In Ireland you mean the country or the, the annex section? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> The country, well done. Yeah. <laughs> no, I did, um, so I did a VA there for three years and I finished it over here and then I come to the summer. Ah, that's great. Well, good. Okay. Um, I'm Dane, I'm a PhD student. Yeah, yeah. oh, I mean, hello. <laughs> yeah. uh, my research is based, it's centered around an idea of temporality and how real time systems in a network aged are redefining how, what it is to deal with time, especially with regards to how to structure it, how, how to develop a me methodology to understand it while taking in ideas of quantum physics, incomplete consistencies, and uncertainty. My art practice is... Wait, wait, use my right there. Now, for all of you that are having a small but not insignificant heart attack, <laughs> he didn't sound like this when he was doing his MA. Okay, I just want to say this, okay? He's, this is hard work. It's got him and, it's, and slight insanity and sleepless nights. Um, my art practice is, is a mixture of video, sound, installation, digital stuff. It, at the moment I'm looking at how it, my work transfers and delivers sense through its through wavelengths of sound, light, and feedback, basically. Hmm, interesting. Very interesting. Any questions for Dane? Dane is also the person who does the video uh, for both this class and for the PhD, and is my assistant. <laughs> Come for philosophy, say back work. That's right. Yes, thank you. <laughs> and time's in. Um, I've been looking at water and um, kind of, is it creased or not? Or is it stripy or smooth? And other things like that. 
Um, and kind of the water in our bodies and the erotic embrace of water. And um, I've also been just sticking bits of previous bits of work next to new bits of work and sort of setting up little relationships where they're kind of talking to each other. Mm. Um, yeah. And what brought you, are you taking the class or are you sitting in the class? I'm taking it. Yeah. Oh my god, glutton for punishment. Wow. <coughs> I hope I do the best. <laughs> no, you won't regret it. Well, I don't regret it. But. Ah, okay. Good. Any questions so far, Tamsin? Okay, before we go here, we're going to jump back to Bruno. Hello, I'm Bruno. I'm doing the MA Fine Art. Uh, for the last seven years, I've been working as a draftsman. So I bring that with me, and now I'm doing a kind of uh, discussed structure of architecture. I'm still working on that, but in a different way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, did you, can you get a picture of his work from that? <laughs> No. What, can you give an example or can you describe it a bit more? I work with drawing, sculpture, video, and I use fragments of, of plants, of, uh, basically, basically of plants, and I transport them for, for, for doing this, the sculpture, drawing, with, with that fragment, hmm. and construct something else. So it's a kind of this constructs and construction. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Anita. Yeah. I, um, I'm Anita. Um, part time year one of um, art and design. I um, do drawing and print work. Um, yeah. Now, I just have to say that the very first time you sat in the class, which was in October. Yeah. I thought that you weren't going to stay. <laughs> That's great. You're still here. It's excellent after all this because we went all around and then I asked, I think I asked you, or somehow it came out, what do you think? And you're like, I don't know what I'm doing here. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just great that you're still here. So why are you still here? You just have nothing more to do on a Tuesday evening. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Punishment. Yeah, I thought, yeah. Good. Good. Excellent. That's a good answer. George. Hi, my name is George. I am a musician and a composer. I live in Bristol, play in a couple of bands. Um, here I'm studying uh, arts and project management. Um, I run a festival in Bristol, festival was in Warwick last year, actually, Warwickshire, um, called Small Is, which is kind of based around the works of Schumacher and his Small Is Beautiful. I'm working within the Schumacher circle to put on a uh, kind of art. Arts feeding into development, feeding back into the arts, basically, is kind of how we, how we couched it. Um, and I've just started a project here as part of my placement, working with uh, a project called Interactivos, um, which is part of the Cross Innovations, which is kind of using the creative industries to feed into the less creative industries and as a source of kind of inspiration. Um, and this is the placement that you've got through Michaela. Through Michaela, yeah. Yeah, she's great, isn't she? She is. So anybody who needs a, a placement uh, in their course, come see me or come see George, actually, because he got a placement via Michaela, who runs the Erasmus program here, or she's one, one of the many things she does. And she is, has her fingers in many pots where she could place you in ways that are quite, I think, interesting, really. Pretty good yeah, for the like, so. Yeah, yeah, because she's, she really has a sense of where, where things are linked. Richard. Uh, hello, I'm Mark. Um, media Arts Policy Practice. Um, I did my undergrad at Greenwich uh, in Media and Communications. Uh, I would say I'm a musician, but I'm not really doing any music at the moment. I know, but I do think the two musicians are sitting next to each other. <laughs> it's like a magnet. Uh, you know, I'm not really doing any of them in it. Lip bits, but not a lot. Um, sort of like glitch stuff. Nice so, so the work that you, the kind of music you're doing though, when you're doing it, is like atonal. Yeah. So ish. that and glitch music, which I really like, which is the sort of sounds that uh, 
than expected within transmissions of things, so like skipping CDs or strange sounds that computers make that they're not supposed to make. So it all like when your TV kind of glitches out for a second or something like that. That's like the structures of the sounds that are made. Within so are you one of these impossible people to sit next to because you have a recorder and every time you hear something? Like record it. I, I, I used to be like that. I was <laughs> really bad. Um, probably about three or four years ago, I recorded everything. And I, but then I started to realise that uh, my friends realised that they wouldn't say certain things <laughs> around me because I was basically archiving everything that was going on, all the audio archive for my whole life and everything that they were saying. So, um, and then I put it into mixes, particularly. So I do like a mix with some. Uh, like the vinyl and stuff, but then I'd uh, also put in the very revealing things that my friends have said to me and then hand it out to people on CD. <laughs> <laughs> so in the future, you know that you have to go through the ethics committee. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But they're yeah, the most interesting like things, as long as they're not like two to the core. Um, <laughs> he says. Thing. Normally when they're absolutely wasted, because when people are wasted, they say the best things. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm Millie, I'm doing MA Fine Art full time and I do sculpture and it's kind of based on like a kind of pair of sculptures kind of based on equilibrium and yeah, kind of the fact that, that human intervention could or your interaction with the pieces could have the whole things. Come on. Yeah. You have to give the extra one to Mark because we ran out. Of course, that one. The course, that one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've done it. Go on, Millie. I think that was, that was it, eh? Yeah, I, was, I don't really know much else. To, yeah, kind of tensions and materials, like for their physical qualities. So you had some weird thing that you had, like this uh, thing on the floor that like just kind of melted. Plasticky type things. What was that? Oh, what? Oh, yeah, my it's, teeth. Just drops a mirror. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. It's just kind of like about the like reflections and the temporality of the reflections. Oh, uh, yeah. When you like move in, <coughs> and you might not really notice it's there. And it was kind of just as you walked in, people like yeah. take it and it would change the entire effect. Of the space yeah. And stuff like that. So you're interested in those kind of relationships? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. I'm going to go back to you. Hi, I'm Katie. I'm on the fine art part time. Um, I also do sculpture. And um, at the moment, like Tamsin said with her work, she's um, like I am. I'm looking at um, lots of different um, pieces of my work and trying to link them together to just to explore what it actually is about my work that's driving me. So it's quite difficult at the moment. But um, my work, um, uh, not my practical work, um, I'm in photography and printing, mm -hmm. and I'm the artist in residence at a art school in Shrewsbury, which is where I'm from. Oh, and how do you get that? Because uh, I paid them off. Because <laughs> you're good, did you say? No, because I'm lucky. <laughs> oh, because um, you're lucky. I literally went um, in the summer when they had their final show, um, one of the courses I and I was just looking around and then I noticed that they'd had an artist in residence and I was like, oh, so uh, how do I get onto this? And they were just like, are you interested? I was like, yeah, they were like, right, then start next week. And that's it. Wow. Okay. <laughs> okay. I have to explain something to you. Completely look. In the future, there's a better way to say that. Okay. <laughs> that you know? yeah, we'll, we'll work on your, your story. I'm too honest. No, no. I'm not saying you shouldn't be honest. I'm just saying that your honesty needs help. <laughs> okay, it needs a color, it right. needs, you know. So they looked at you and just said, that's it? You want to well, look at your work? Previously, or they'd had um, a printmaker, so they just wanted something completely different. Uh huh. Did they not see any of your work? Um, no. Okay, again. Um, <laughs> and then they were just like, describe some new sculpture, so I just started talking. They were like, okay. Oh, so you did actually say something other than just stand yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> what I'm just saying is that, you know, so you actually said, my work does hmm. something. Yeah. What was it that your work did? Uh, well, I was Nothing. describing the work I'd made for my degree show because I went straight from the BA here. 
And can you describe it to us, and then we'll decide whether or not you should be an artist. Okay. So, um, <laughs> one of the pieces was over 11 foot tall. It was made out of lots of different fabrics. It ended up costing me almost a thousand pounds. Um, it's okay. that detail, <laughs> while interesting, okay, I'm going to help you here now. Why did it cost those? What, what was the material made out of? Glitter? Resin? Fabrics. Fabrics. Fabrics alone cost. What was it? Silk? Uh, no, they were just really expensive cottons. Okay, we got the fact that they cost you a thousand pounds. Was it a good dye job or something on them? Um, yeah, they've been hand dyed. I ah. got them from like um, basically expensive fabric shops. <laughs> yes. Yes, we know yeah. this now. It's very yeah. clear that that was a very serious aspect of it. <laughs> so it was 11 foot of very, 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 very expensive And then material. I just like to combine it with materials that then cost me nothing. So bits of wood I found from workshops and I tied it all together with elastic bands and string and rope and nails and tape. Yeah. Okay. Would you take her in as a residence? I would. Yeah, I thought that was pretty good. Thanks. Still want to see the work. <laughs> That's good. Okay, next. Um, I'm Joanne. I'm on the MA Fine Art um, part time course, mm -hmm. and I'm a painter. And I do paintings of non figurative interiors. Um, previously, my inspiration is sort of connected to themes of the uncanny, domestic spaces. Um, just trying to experiment with objects and um, parts, the construction and angles of, um, and the general perspective of spaces to distort it and reveal something, I suppose, of myself within them. Mm -hmm. um, and my main source of inspiration is usually in about photographs of abandoned homes mm -hmm. or <coughs> derelict spaces, for some reason I just seem to connect to those and it tends to inspire it. Hmm. And uh, do you paint in acrylic or oil? In acrylic, yeah. And why? Why is that? Um, I used to paint in oils when I was uh, really young, but I just found that acrylic was a lot easier for me it's to use. Mm -hmm. But um, I sort of still feel that's an area that really needs to be developed yeah. with myself. Because I didn't necessarily come, when I did my BA, I didn't start sort of in an art background. I'd done the textiles and fashion sort of years before, and then had a career in retail. My God, how old are you? <laughs> oh, never mind, I don't do it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I had like a 10 year um, career in retail management, huh. and I uh, decided I had an experience that just made me um, want to look at my life and make changes and I decided I'd always wanted to do art so I just went back and yeah. most of my friends couldn't understand why I would be wanting to change that at sort of a later point in my life but I did it um, so I still feel like the initial sort of training you might get and the experiment you did at college and stuff I've missed out on so I still feel that's an yeah. area that's nice. that needs to be developed. So your friends did not understand why you left retail and what yeah. is your art? Okay, now, <laughs> there's a whole bunch of people here that you're going to become friends with because they're going to love that. Especially <laughs> Annika, who lost herself in the middle of a retail moment. Yeah, that's a big time. Yeah, I know, of course. <laughs> yeah, that is what it's called. Welcome. That's great. Hello, um, I'm Samantha. I'm on the BA here doing fine art. So coaching to see if I want to do this next year. <laughs> um, um, my practice is all text-based at the moment. So what, what does it mean to have a, a text-based practice? What does that actually mean? It means people ask you a lot, how is that art? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> um, it sort of exists in different ways. A lot, a lot of what I'm doing at the moment is um, writing, stenciling directly onto the wall, but not in like a Crass, childish way. So it's well, like, hopefully, it's <laughs> sort of a crass, childish way. <laughs> but um, it's not all like the gaps in the stencil, which is sort of what people imagine as soon as you say stencil. Um, sort of playing with the presence of text, 
sort of being very aware that it operates in absence. So I'm not there to reinforce it, but that can be quite interesting in a lot of ways. You can deliberately lead people down the wrong path, or it's, it's interesting to hear what people think you're trying to tell them when you're not there. Because often... What do you mean when you're not there? When do you have like a microphone? <laughs> <laughs> then they, they come up to you later and say, oh, your, your writing's about this, isn't it? And you know, well, it's, it's not to me when I wrote it down, but if that's what it's operating as now, then that's what it's operating as for you. Um, and, and what did... Where did you come into in the program? Where did you, I mean, I don't know the BA programs that well, so is it like a general art program or? Yeah, just a, just a, don't you have a port, portfolio or something when you come in? Oh yeah, I did a, I did a foundation for us. <laughs> yeah. uh, I forgot about that. <laughs> the foundation diploma somewhere else. And, and, and so you have a portfolio of something that yeah. looked like images or pictures. Yeah. And what were those? Um, they were, there was still a lot of text going on, but they were more physical as well. It's sort of um, not more interested in all the like, compulsive habits that I have. You sort of like make these little stars out of strips of paper, and I made thousands and thousands and thousands of these things, and filled them up in bottles, and I knew exactly how many stars were in every different bottle, and um, um, writing things on the inside of bottle caps over and over and over again. Hundreds and hundreds of these things. Like what did you write? Um, I wrote inside the bottle caps. I will not fixate on the number of objects. <laughs> <laughs> and I covered uh, the little studio space that I had, little boxed in room. I covered it floor to ceiling and post-it notes saying I will not obsess over repetitive tasks. <laughs> and like three or four layers of post-it notes thick. Um, so, yeah, we were so now you've graduated to making slightly longer phrases, longer phrases and yeah. not repeating them so often, no, or getting yeah. a spray paint, you know, so it's yeah. a lot easier. Yeah. So it's, it's thinking a lot more about how just splitting up a sentence into different lines where you choose to, to break the flow, of, the flow of the text or the speech, Try, trying to make it imitate speech as well, because there are natural pauses that's emphatic that people don't think about it as much when they're writing but then when you read the writing you'll still put those breaks in so it's just sort of trying to force breaks in the text um, do you find that texting that changes? has changed your way of thinking like literally texting uh, I haven't really thought about that but I, I'm, I don't text in the normal way that most people do like I can't, I can't stand the abbreviations that are okay when you text somebody even the word okay, I always spell it okay. I should, I, if if I was going to write okay, okay, it would be capital O, full stop, capital K. <laughs> it's I, I I think it makes people lazier about talking in general. Um, I think because it's so instant, people make the mistake of thinking that they can fix it straight away. It's not it's not like speech. There is that gap and there's that distance. Um, Actually, I meant it slightly differently. Have you ever studied other languages, like let's say Hebrew, for example, or I any of the languages that I'm have? I'm terrible at other languages. Well, the reason I mention that is because something like Hebrew or some of the other um, languages that have that don't have uh, expression. What's the letters called? What are they called? The C. Uh, so, so, yeah. Uh, the way in which that operates is that there's no vowels. Not not in Russian, but I mean, like in Hebrew, for example, there's no vowels. So you just through the pronunciation add the vowel. And um, and sometimes you add a little dot somewhere for it. And that, that's true for a lot of the Arabic is like that. Um, I'm not sure how Chinese operates. I don't think they're vowels though, they're more like images. So it might be interesting for you at some point to start leaping out of um, English and, and all the sort of Anglo-Saxon, German, you know, the, the kind of Latin-based things and going into some sort of really wild thing where they, not so much text, because obviously that's annoying you, but um, but something like the languages that don't have the vowels. Yeah, I, mean, I think that um, sort of Chinese and things like that, that, that's been something that I have thought about, because it's, uh, 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 letters, you kind of think of them as a, as a letter, but at the end of the day, it's just, it's a, it's a symbol, really, mm -hmm. that has a meaning attached to it. And then when you go back to hieroglyphics, they're all pictures, 
but the, the pictures have, have meanings attached, just like letters do, but we've sort of removed letters from images now. They're, they're different things, but that, that's what it is. It's a, it's a mark that carries like mm. universal meaning to people who speak that language, but it, I suppose because uh, it's the grouping of them that gives you the meaning. So if you've got a, a symbol that can mean a whole concept, like a picture, it is, it is more like a picture. Than a, it's, it's, so I was reading a book um, the, uh, the other day called High Horse, or Riding High, Riding High that's what it's called. Uh, and, um, and in it, this woman who's a, who studies uh, the equine, um, she found that in one uh, place in the South, South um, African area that she's working in, um, there are 60 different <coughs> names for a brown horse in this one uh, arena. And to which she said that she got into this whole problem where she started getting into what she called the Margaret Mead um, problem of anthropology, which is that she went to these like tribes to see, you know, like, you know, how do you help this horse that has worms, you know, do you give it, you know, some sort of corn and this, is there something, and the guy said, well, we give it equinox, and then what do you give the horse? And for anybody that has horses, they know that equinox is a wormer. And so it's like looking for the, sort of the you know, the, the first people's way of, you know, sort of the native thing doing it, and then it turned out, well, you know, we just use, you know, what do you guys use? <laughs> we use equinox. It just reminded me of it. So be careful what you look for in terms of like how they yeah. operate. But anyway, that's great. Uh, my name's Andre. I'm on the MA Media Arts Master of Practice, uh, first year part time one. Uh, I guess previously I've been taking photographs. I've not made any work for a little bit. Um, I promise to get back into making work this term. Um, I'm starting to become interested in. Uh, something called the Museums Collection Centre. Uh, these are places that, that I'm starting to find across the country and across the world. And these are um, places where museums store additional objects that they're not showing at the point. So uh, I'm, I'm meeting someone next week that's got a way into the Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery Museum Collection Centre. So I'm, what I'm expecting, and I shouldn't place an expectation on it, but I'm, Nonetheless, I'm placing an expectation up, but expecting to kind of find a place where um, the history is almost flattened, I guess, and um, these uh, collections are arbitrarily placed um, just as a kind of a utilitarian way of kind of packaging them. And maybe in the way that they kind of place, um, the, a new narrative might open up um, with having these completely disassociated things sitting next to each other. Um, maybe uh, Francis Fukuyama's at the end of history, kind of, I don't know. Could be interesting. Um, we'll have a chat later. Fukuyama. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Uh, it writes right Fukuyama. <laughs> What's that? It writes Fukuyama. No, 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 it's important to know your enemies. So. <laughs> 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 However terrible you might be. Um, anyway, that's good, that's good. Does everybody remember everybody's name so far? What about this row? Everybody remember this row? No? The heat? I never do. Anybody remember this row? No, that's Andre. 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 But it was close, it was an A. Okay. An AM. So you got two points there. I'm actually really, really excited. Okay. Who's this? Sam. 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 Or Samantha. Do you go by Sam or Samantha? Samantha. In this class, you can pick whatever name you want to be called by. You just have to stick with that name. You want to be called Samantha? Okay. Thompson. Okay. Everybody get that? Okay. Good. You've memorized notes because I'm going to come back to you guys. So. Okay. okay. I'm Nick, but my second name's Griffin, so I don't know what to call myself. I'm Nick anyway. <laughs> what would you like to call yourself? Nick. Okay. Um, I don't do age either, but th this is my sort of second incarnation, and I'm doing uh, art, uh, BA level six. Uh, I do what I call land art, which consists of sort of making weird objects and uh, taking them out to the landscape and taking photographs of them and throwing them in rivers and things. You say throwing them in rivers? That, that works best, because you sort of... Um, Pollute, anyway. Oh, no, they're, they're <laughs> But, but um, it, you, 
the whole idea is to uh, is to look at the landscape and, and, and it's, a, it's a sort of discovery that that looks very good, whatever you do, you know, it's, it's, it's an easy win. That one. Um, I, I'm, I'm here because uh, I'm looking for another incarnation when the degree comes to an end and, and uh, considering What were your previous incarnations? Uh, I was what's called a forensic psychiatrist. Wow, that's fabulous. I didn't mention that because we can get into that. Did you ever work with, uh, you know, I was in the Netherlands where they have, uh, where they put, they find uh, dead bodies, well, they find bodies that are obviously that are dead, uh, and they uh, piece together the face. Did you do, uh, were you connected with any of that? No, a forensic psychiatry is about living people. <laughs> uh, <Damn>. Mentally <laughs> disordered offenders, so it's about huh. uh, psychiatry and people who, you know, secure units and that sort of thing. Huh. And how did you move from that to to throwing things in the water, although I'm beginning to see that? Uh, <laughs> he knows I, I, I went voluntarily. Uh, I, got, I got to sort of when I could retire, and it was nearly killing me, so I thought I'd do something completely different. Yeah. Uh, my father was an artist, and I wanted to do it on my own. Daughter uh, is also uh, an artist, and I, I just wanted to have gone through without touching the sides. Well, see, this is the problem, with, you know, with kind of like trying to overthrow the father. You know, you're in this horrible situation where you can't be like your dad, but your daughter can be like your gra her grandfather because she didn't overthrow what you did. So the two of them can do something interesting, and you had to go into forensic psychiatry. I mean, honestly. Oh, right. <laughs> I always wondered why I went into forensic psychology. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. Anyway, good, thank you. Okay, your turn. Uh, Arch, Wait. I'm doing the... Uh, Wait, did everybody hear who this was? Uh, Arch. 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 I'm the other one with the American accent in the classroom. I'm doing uh, queer studies in the arts and culture, the master's program, and um, still am having a hard time talking about my arts-based practice because it's so... My, I think of my arts-based practice sort of as, as like the, uh, I don't know, the punk version of like, screw you, arts-based practice, you can't tell me what to do. Because um, it's all really, really cheap materials and um, inexpensive ways to make things that are about me surrounding a lot of um, identity and anonymity and I'm starting to focus on sort of mass as a form of like senselessness. Did you say mass or mass? Mass. Mass. M-A-S-S. Yes. Um, so like multiplicity. Mm -hmm. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm doing um, a bunch of like really tiny little, um, I'm doing like... Post-it notes? Kind of, yeah. <laughs> um, Samantha? <laughs> right. No, I'm doing, uh, you know those like terrible, like the school pictures you get when you're in like, you know, second grade or whatever. Um, the ones that you hand out to all the people that, you know, your family doesn't really want to give, like, the four by six to. <laughs> You're never going to actually go and put this in your house. Um, I'm doing that size of um, every trans person who's been murdered for being trans over the past seven, ten years. Um, because there's a person who's been amassing those names and uh, photographs and all that. So I'm interested in what that would look like when you walk into a room and there's, like, a wall covered with them. With these really tiny little things. Um, and again, they're related back to my own identity and my own, you know, sort of processes, but, um, but yeah, a lot of the stuff that I make is not made out of, I'm like the opposite of the really expensive materials. <laughs> I'm, well, like, I'm the opposite now. Right, I know. <laughs> well, I guess so, if you spent all your fortune on this. I have the problem of, like, I walk into, like, Wilkinson and I'm like, look, dollar acrylics, that's, because it doesn't matter how expensive the acrylics are, when you paint them glass, they look like shit, and you have to, like, work them a certain way to make them look like anything. So, yeah. That's great. And, do you think that what you're doing has anything to do with being a victim? Is there a victim situation going on? I think that... Um, Claire, take notes. <laughs> I think that sort of under the... Because a lot of the things surrounding like anonymity and sort of that like fear and disgust that, that surround the communities that I tend to work with, which are queer communities, um, there tends to be a lot of victimization, whether it's, you know, victimization that people... I mean, we're the only community that isn't born into our community. You know, like people, you know, um, like race relations in America are still like very, very different. But you know, you, if you're born into a family of color, you don't like wake up one day and go like, shit, I have to tell mom and dad I'm black. And, like we have to do that in like queer communities. You have to be like, oh, I'm genderqueer. Oh, I'm, you know, and you have to, and there's this like misnomer of the coming out process that there's like this, you come out 
at one point, and then, whoop, you're out, Ooh, hooray. I bet people forget that, like, because of underdetermination and all of those things and assumptions in society, that it's not, it's a never ending process. You don't ever stop. And you choose when it's like the same, you know, if I'm in Georgia and I'm like, you know, putting gas at a gas station or something like. In your car. Right. <laughs> yeah, like you know, like, yeah, you just, yeah, you sort of point, putting petrol in the car. Yeah. Um, you, you may not come out as much, you know, and it may be, you know, when somebody asks you about you and your lover or you and your gender queer, polyamorous partner, you know, like. Is that your sister? Like, yep, absolutely, and we will be out of your town as quick as we can. Thank you very much. So, yeah, I, I do think, yeah, there's definitely a form of victimization, especially around the anonymity mm. aspect of like covering faces and Craigslist ads and all that stuff. Yeah, interesting. Anybody comes for arch? No. Thank you. Okay. Uh, my name is Yasmin. Um, I'm doing. Do you know, or do you know, um, are you into maths as such? I mean, do you like math, do you like doing math puzzles yes. and things? <laughs> yes. Mark, help her, because you two are doing silences and music. Yes, yeah, spaces, so yeah. Huh. And why, why do you think, I mean, not just in your case, because a lot of people might face this, but why do you think that you're not doing work right now? What is it that's stopping you? Finding the right materials to say, to present the kind of influence. Mm. And um, so, like a place, an element of our place, mm -hmm. or something, and bring it in here and bring it back. Um, but it's not film. Mm -hmm. So, um, what do you use in that case? To mm -hmm. represent a time frame? So people have to help them. This is, I bet you there are people in this room that have some ideas as you're speaking. Yeah. Well, that sounds really happy. Yes. Yes. Finding the right materials. Yeah. Maybe sounds. I've never really used sounds for this. Have you used darkness or you know different you know like pitch black? Spaces with just sound, something like that. Lights, color, um, film, and textiles a lot of my installations. I like to play with space and time and the subjunctive. Um, 
well, I've been making this week on, and last week. Uh, AHRC application. Oh yeah, part of the AHRC application, which has focused me actually, it's mm. helped me to know what I want to do. But physically, I've been making a body card <coughs> of uh, my daughter who's 14 in the sort of day girl pose of the young dancer at age 14. So she had to stand with her back very arched for about half an hour. And um, I've made a, a plaster cast of it and I'm going to do a latex skin and put some copper wires. But I was talking to Joe today about putting other things in it as well to maybe make it a bit more of a statement, like a feminist statement. So I've got to think about what to embed in the layers. But it's going to be basically like a skin that just hangs with... I'm thinking either wires or something going down the spine. <coughs> the sort of traces. Well, I was originally, but also because they hold the form, because it's going to be really ethereal, so I've got to have something that holds that curve. And I can embed them quite easily in the latex, but I've got a knitted copper tube that I'm going to put in, and then I think if I leave it out, I can put bits in it. Hmm. Maybe that's why I might do something else. In fact, I might actually throw a bit of go onto it, I was thinking. You don't have to have just one, right? You can have several arch backs. Yeah, no, I'm going to do lots of different ones, like five glass. And mm. Actually, I want to do one out of um, rice paper, because I did some drawings on rice paper that I varnished, and it gets quite hard. I made a kind of sculpture, actually. Great. Yeah. Um, I'm Andrew. Um, I'm here after quite a long gap. I did a the taught part of a master's course about 15 years ago and I'm here just to write the dissertation because they very nicely said that I could. Um, and uh, so I'm not talking about that particularly but something else that interests me that I'm going to do some work on. Uh, well I talked about that last time. Wasn't That's true. Um, I've been interested in a, a, a hardly talked about a group of monks, Italian based monks called Maldolese. And what interests me about them is uh, their social arrangements, because they are split into two separate groups within their establishment. So you've got some that live as hermits and others that kind of service them. But the people that are doing the servicing, they also do something with the outside population. They're very interested in teaching. And I came across these when I was in Venice used to live there and the, they, their church there is now the um, it's the cemetery chapel and it's got the most uh, amazing sort of jewel box of a facade to it and it's, it's really beautiful it's got this white rustication on it um, and if you ask people where the pattern for this rustication comes from I mean people that are you know architectural professor architectural historians and have been for years they say, oh, it's, cl it's a classical motif, you know, and you say, well, yes, so where can I see it then? And they go, well, I'll have to get back to you, nobody ever knows. So that interested me. Mm. Um, and so I started looking into them, and what I found was that uh, at a period of about 40 years prior to the building of this church, the general, as they're called, of the order, so the head, the head honcho in this group of monks, was um, involved in possibly one of the most interesting political things that happened within religion at that period, in so much as he was the guy that um, wrote the concord between the papacy and the um, patriarch of Byzantium, unifying the two churches again, because you know that the Greek church and the Catholic church are separated. And the more I looked into them, the more I found that they kept turning up in these peculiarly high political places, but nobody talks about them. They're quite difficult to find out about. You just get these snippets of things. And so th that's sort of fascinating me. So I'm interested in 
their politics. I'm interested in the art and architecture that they made and whether that reflects any of these political things that they did. But that's quite hard because the, the board has been quite well disbanded in, in so much as buildings have been knocked down, paintings and sculpture has been removed. Uh, Napoleon closed down a lot of things when he came into Italy. So th things found their way into the loop, possibly I'm hoping. Uh, some things disappeared, it seems, again when the Austrians came in, so maybe there's some things in Vienna or thereabouts that might be of interest. Um, so I'd like to see if I, how much of that stuff I can put together, because most people that I've found that write about them only really write about uh, their beliefs. You know, in terms of um, the, the sort of Christian beliefs, their, their ethic, as it were. But as to how that sort of, why they've got their fingers in these pies, why it is that they're going out into the communities, and yet they've got this reserved section of people. But those sorts of issues kind of fascinate me. Interesting. Any questions for Andrew? You were working on... Uh yeah, obelisks. Yes, yes, that's what I'm writing for my dissertation. I'm writing about um, an iconography for obelisks, what obelisks mean when they appear in uh, Italian paintings of, let's say, the 15th century, most, 15th, 16th century. So is that connecting to the kind of motif around the, the Well, the, the only way it really connects is um, because I was looking, I couldn't find any examples of this rustication anywhere, really. Well, anyway. Um, so I was looking. I think it maybe there wasn't anything else really built at that time, but perhaps uh, if you start looking at paintings of that time, you might see it as an ephemeral matter in, in a, you know, the, the cityscapes in the background of paintings. Um, and of course, most of the paintings are religious from that period that, that still exist. Um, and in looking at the cityscapes, I started to see obelisks everywhere I looked, or it felt that way. And, they're obviously they're Egyptian, so you know, what the hell are they doing there? Napoleon again? No, no, I'm talking about 1400s. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Last person survived. I'm Charlotte. I'm doing uh, MA Quest Studies in Art and Culture. Um, I practice photography, a kind of documentary work about gender identity, uh, the LGBT community and a uh, different culture and um, I work about uh, scientific, or political and social approach about that. Mm -hmm. And what brought you here? I'm here because um, it's, a, it's a lecture for my MA career. <laughs> You're forced <laughs> to take it. Yes, yeah, I didn't know what, why are you here in this room? Why are you here in this um, because mm -hmm. I have um, made a scientific bachelor become to in, in arts, mm -hmm. and I'm very interested in physics and mathematics, and mm -hmm. so I think it's very interesting this lecture for that. Mm. Interesting. Okay, can anybody do all the names? Mm -hmm. Do a lot more now. Okay, Claire. <laughs> Charlotte. Wait, wait. Go slow. Maybe. Yes. Charlotte. Yeah. Andrew. Jasmine, Arch, Nick, Andrea. Andre. 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 Not Andrea. Uh, and not Antonio. Only on Sunday. Sam or Samantha. Joanne. Uh, okay. Two. Okay. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. Tamsin. Tamsin. Yeah. Day. Emma. Claire. <laughs> That's good. Bruno. <laughs> Um, Annika, Sarah. Wait, who's next to you? Natalia. Yeah, Natalia. Natalia. Mm -hmm. I too know you know, but I've forgotten these three. Wait, wait. So who's that? Um, begins with an A. Yes, <laughs> and ends with an A. Mm -hmm. Andrew. <laughs> it's not Andrea, it's not Annika. Okay. <laughs> Anita. Very good. Okay. Also the name of the child that has been born recently to parents that we will not name. It was all over the paper forever. 
and still is. Such a G. George. Yes. <laughs> George. So you're George. George. Regal George. George. Regal George. Or just Regal. I don't think it's Your Majesty. <laughs> Mar. Very good. Excellent. Very good. Very good. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Well done. Okay. And I'm Johnny. Johnny. <laughs> That's right. Now, are you ready to begin? Shall we play ball? Okay. We're going to take a look at the course outline. Um, and I'm going to give a my, my new lecture before Mark has to leave. Hey, are you going to be yeah. back? I hope so, yeah. <laughs> I mean, within your, your lifetime. Okay. Hopefully, not five minutes. <laughs> okay, well, we're just going to go through this, so. Okay. Um, I hope we get back before the lecture starts. Do you want to drop the door? Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. You go out that way and up yeah. the little stairs. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me, are these readings going to be on Brookbox? Yes, they're all. They're, uh, in fact, I'll go through this whole thing so you, you'll know. Uh, yes, they, they should all be on Dropbox right now. Dane, <laughs> our web person. Okay. Um, the first thing is, is that what I need from you guys is to sign transcript. Let's see. Let's see if I got a piece of paper here. Can you know, just put your name and as clearly as you can write it, your email and a phone number. Um, just name, email, phone number, and then we're going to send around, so we'll all have that list, and um, I'll be sending you um, information that way. I know that we're supposed to use Moodle, but I, I just don't. Okay, so I'm sorry. I just can't seem to get my head around Moodle, and Moodle can't get around me, so we have agreed to disagree. So we use Dropbox, um, or we use Google Plus, or whatever. Okay. Um, as you know, this is called Untimely Meditations. It's called Untimely Meditations uh, because it is in deference and reference and reverence to uh, Nietzsche, who wrote uh, a book called, many books, one of them was called Untimely Meditations. Um, and uh, he, as many of you may or may not know, uh, he's got a checkered, uh, let's say past, or check, checkered reputation. Um, I like his checkered reputation. I do not think that he was a founder of anything that would be considered fascist or negative in that sense. Um, so that, that's one of the reasons I think it's important to, well, that's not why I think it's important. I think it's important to read him because he, in the middle of all this time period when people were coming up with very um, strategically closed notions of identity, Nietzsche was way outside the box. And he wrote a book called Ecce Homo, E-C-C-E, -E, Homo, uh, which is, if you know the expression from the Bible uh, where Paul is saying, um, there, is, there is man, or there, th this man, well, not Paul, but it's slightly different. Like when Jesus was uh, claiming that he was God, and there was a fight about this, um, the uh, king, what's his name? Herod, yeah, King Herod. Um, when Jesus was brought to him and thrown in front of him, Herod said, this is man, or there is man. And by that he meant, you think you're God? Well, you're not a God, you're a man. Ecce homo, he said, Ecce homo, this man. Now that gets translated in a lot of different ways, and Nietzsche is really quite fabulous in the way he starts to say this. He starts thinking about the question of this, and also the kind of paradoxical relationship with this word man, which is paradoxical on many, many levels that we'll find in this class, apart from male, female, trans, all the species that we can come up with. The, the, the question of what does it mean to say this here, now, am I alive, and also now dead at the same time. So it, it's a Ecce Homo, when you hear it from now on, hopefully you'll realize that there's this, already there's this interplay between being here and claiming something, being perceived as being dead or almost dead, being uh, played with, uh, with and against, in this case, uh, man, God, here, gone. So this whole Ecce Homo remark establishes this run uh, for Nietzsche, uh, which he calls untimely. And the whole course is basically an untimely meditation, so it's, it's almost dedicated in that sense to Nietzsche. Now, I'm just going to go through this with you. Um, 
the reason I'm asking you to put your names on that piece of paper as clearly as you can, uh, because I will have to read it, and if I get it wrong, you will not know what's going on, is that you will be invited to join Dropbox. Uh, I'm beginning to think that maybe it should be Google Plus. I have to sneeze. <coughs> Sorry. The reason I think this is because the books are very large, and unless you start buying uh, extra space on Dropbox, you have to pay for it, right? I mean, so that's ridiculous. No? I haven't had any trouble with that. No? Okay. Well, maybe that's, that's good. Um, I have. You have. <laughs> well, I think that Google Plus is bigger or it's infinite, but I could be wrong about that. The only problem with Google Plus is that it's Google, and Google tends to have little surveillance moments going on. Not that Dropbox doesn't, but in fact, I was at uh, MIT in May. Uh, and uh, the guy, my brother was graduating from their MBA program, and they uh, had this guy who was a valedictorian speaking, and he was the founder of Dropbox, and this guy is like 26, and his big claim to fame is that he realized that he wanted to have his stuff on all his different computers when he was going to his parents' house in somewhere versus somewhere else, and it dawned on him Dropbox, and from that he made billions of dollars. It's like, <laughs> it's like so. I almost don't want to use it, but Google has more issues, I think. Anyway, we'll, we'll try. Are you having problems accessing the PDFs? No, just because they're so big. You are, just, just as you said, you've got to buy more space because it tells me every time I turn my computer on that I've run out of space. Yeah. If, um, if, if there's more than George that has this problem, then we'll move over to Let's Google. Let's not move on my account, but. Well, I have that too. You have that problem too. He says that to me. So. Well, I can't use it anyway. Well, yeah, but your problem doesn't count. <laughs> I mean, it counts, but it doesn't count in this particular example. Um, well, we could try. Do you think Google Plus would be better? I don't know. What, what if people? I mean, I've. I mean, we're, we'll still have it available on Dropbox, correct? Oh yeah. No, no, no it's just a quite okay. What I'll do is I'll invite you into Google Plus, but I'll also invite you into Dropbox, and then we'll just keep growing. Um, everything that's on here either is already on Dropbox or will be in the very near future. There's very few things, I'll go through the list with you, um, but there's very few things that are not on Dropbox, um, so they should all be here. Uh, the course, um, I changed it a little bit from last year, because you do that. My um, initial remark last year was that this was the second half of a, of a two-level course, and I'm not, but I got bored of that. I thought actually this, the, the people here in this in the, the school are very smart. I mean, try get, getting to the door with your head. I mean, but you're, you guys are smart, and you're you have a certain kind of energy which I really like. I really appreciate it. So I had to change the course. I had to change the course so that you could feel intellectually and creatively what it meant to have flow and what it meant to deal with energy. This time, not from some sort of study like literally looking at the, catching it like a butterfly and putting a pin in it, but actually getting a sense of how this flow operates. And this is, in, in a certain sense, what is behind uh, rethinking the whole of reality in terms of the quanta, in terms of quanta, which you may already know, quanta means bundles of energy. A quanta is a bundle of light. In case you didn't know that, now you know it, see? Now you can already speak at dinner parties and sound like you know what you're talking about. So. Um, so a quanta is a bundle of energy. And the question is, how do you think in bundles? A bundle is a very odd word. And already, for me to say this and for you to understand it in some way other than a bunch of flax in your hand or a bunch of flowers, for you to think of a bundle in some other way is already putting you in a postmodern or anyway, a very modern environment that is not like the Newtonian physics or the Cartesian worlds of, of not that long ago, even 20 years ago. So the quanta, uh, which basically um, uh, Einstein put forward, a, a, as you know, this concept of relativity, uh, he did not, he went back and forth on the quantum, of meta, uh, the, the question of quantum physics and quantum mechanics, uh, the debates with Bohr, B-O-H-R, that we'll get into in a little while. But the basic thing is that if science and art and philosophy can't talk to each other, then, then what's up? That seems completely mad to me. Science, not in the 
uh, in the conservative sense of science, but science ciencia, S-C-I-E-N-Z-A, ciencia is in knowledge, is a branch of thinking. And thinking is a branch of logic, and logic is a branch of feeling, and feeling is a branch of the body, and the body is a branch of, of being in the world, and so on it goes. And if they, they shouldn't be as separated as they've become. And this was a way to rethink this. In fact, in May, um, some of the people, including Dane, who may or may not know them, if we had this discussion yet, or if I just had it in my head, um, about alchemy and magic. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, good. OK. So it doesn't come as a surprise. Uh, there's, uh, at the end of May, we're going to put on a big conference on alchemy and, and magic. Uh, and as a way of getting back to the roots of philosophy and science and art. Anyway, now, this course originally emerged because when I was teaching at the Yavanike, I was head of theory at the Yavanike, which is a very weird and crazy, uh, wonderful, uh, post-modern-ish, po what they call post-academic uh, art school uh, in Maastricht in the Netherlands. and. Um, I didn't know how to teach theory, uh, how to teach philosophy to the artists, because the way a lot of the artists were understanding philosophy was that you learned it, and then you applied this model somehow. And that was like wrong. And then on the other hand, there were philosophers there that would take an art object, let's say this fist, although there's controversy in the PhD class as to whether it was an art object, but I digress. Uh, anyway, we'd take a, a piece of work and use it as an example of a model. So both of those types of ways of thinking had to be thrown out. So to repeat what you are not supposed to do, you are not to take a model, let's say dialectics or rhizomatic thinking or the theory of relativity, and apply it to your artwork. Similarly, you are not to take an artwork and say that artwork is exactly what uh, dialectics looks like. Those, both those ways of dealing with um, ciencia, knowledge, will crush both ciencia and your art. So we're going to learn a different way of, of doing it. And that doesn't mean it's any less rigorous, and it doesn't mean it hopefully isn't any less creative. Now, if you look on this first paragraph, it says here um, that we're looking for studying the flow of energy, fluxus, and dimension. I put fluxus in there, so, so those of you may become, if you're not aware of the word or the group called fluxus, you will be in that. Um, we take this uh, flow, this energy, this fluxus, and dimension, and we're going to try and play with it in terms of the sexual and um, the corrosive uh, and the imaginary and so on. Now, this means that we're going to basically look at Nietzsche, expanded on by Heidegger, by the logic of Techna. That will be expanded on and played with by uh, Michel Foucault. Um, and I put various tags, like the order of things or the use of pleasure. Einstein with the special relativity and curve, notions of curved time. Do you know what curved time is, by the way? Just speed speed example of curved time, just so you know. Um, time in, line, in, in, let's say, normal everyday way of thinking of time is that you're born, you live, you die. It's linear. You know, it goes in that direction. Curved time goes like this. It, it moves, there's no straight arrow, as it were, in space. It's like, not just in outer space, but in any space. And what Einstein realized was that gravity hits the arrow of time at every point, so it makes it curve. So that that's why the Earth is round and not square or flat because of gravity. Gravity chops it so that it does this force. And it does it, and the question is how come it doesn't do it so to such a degree that it goes boof, keeps bending, bending, bending. Well, guess what? It does go boof. It's called a black hole. Okay, so they, people didn't know how to talk about that until very, very recently. And then there's also these things called the God particle. We'll get into that. Did you hear about the God particle before? Yeah, okay, good. I'm not saying anything. Either. Okay. Um, we're going to look at Deleuze, D-E-L-E-U-Z-E, -E -E, Logic of the Senses, Deleuze and Guattari. Now, the thing about Deleuze and Deleuze and Guattari is that they're almost like, you know, a lot of people have never read 
Deleuze and Guattari who think that they are either for or against Deleuze and Guattari. I have to say, I, I happen to really love their work, but I didn't love it at first. I used to just go mental every time I read everything because it would be, you know, the schizophrenic this and the something of that. You just think, you know, can't you just say what you're thinking? And do you have to like talk in this language that I can't even get into because I get so annoyed about the way in which the word schizophrenic was being used, so something like that. I got past that eventually um, and actually learned how to read their work and um, hence I have it here. It's, it's quite wonderful. I'm not, a, I'm not a, you know, an acolyte of them, but I, I am a, 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 a very respectful um, follower of some kind. Uh, Guattari was gay, uh, Deleuze was straight, um, and there is a lot of interesting discussion as to why is it that Deleuze becomes famous and Guattari doesn't. Um, on the other hand, Deleuze uh, committed suicide, as so many of these people did. Um, and there's things to keep in mind. So if you want to go become a philosopher, you know, make sure you have your antidepressants to hand. I say that very ser seriously. It's a tough, it's a tough business. Um, let's see, there's Mandelbrot, M-A-N-D-E-L-B-R-O-T, Benoit, a little hat over the O. I mean, over the I. Benoit uh, Mandelbrot, he invented a thing called fractals which I, as uh, in my own philosophic work, uh, that is probably the primary aspect of my work. I take fractals and I rethink quantum physics through the notion of fractal, but we'll get into that at some point, or maybe never. Um, anyway, it's into this question of morphogenesis. Now, morphogenesis is very different than metamorphosis. You know if I use the word metamorph, is it dying of heat in here? Is that hot? Yeah, it's hot. Should we open the window? Yeah, open the window without breaking the frame. That's the task. I don't think uh, we need to do that. That's the task, Millie. Absolutely not. That's all right, I'll give it a go. <laughs> I've done it before. I know. Very beautiful, isn't it? Yes, excellent. Voila. <laughs> well done. Thank you. Still going. There we go. Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, Metamorphosis is, you know, like, has it, people have heard of Kafka, right? Or, I don't know if they write, because then you go back and say no. Um, that was fast. Talk just, fast. <laughs> <laughs> Do you just smoke a cigarette or something? Oh, I smoked a cigarette and I went upstairs and I wow. and They just went speed thing. And it's like speed dating, except speed research project or something. Mm, no, it's not like speed dating. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Anyway, uh, so going back to the morphogenesis. Okay, so Kafka, uh, Franz Kafka, F-R-A-N-Z, Kafka wrote many things, one of which was the metamorphosis. And uh, how many people have read the metamorphosis? It's really great. Grego Sampson wakes up to find he is a bug. That's basically the first line. It's more or less the first line. So this guy who did everything for his family, short of, well, he did everything for he, he cooked, he cleaned, he did six jobs, he get the father couldn't work, the mother wasn't able to work, the sister needed to have her education paid for, if something was going on. Anyway, one day after she like was a violinist. she was a violinist, yeah, so that's why she couldn't work. And there was something else that went on. Um, they, they all had their issues of why they couldn't work. So he did everything for everybody. He was like, you know, the happiness fairy trying to, you know, mother, father, sister, brother, you know, he was everything. And one day he wakes up to find out he's a bug. He's a big cockroach. And he can't believe it. He's like the size of this room, but a cockroach. And uh, the sister, you know, yells at him, you know, where, you know, come on, you know, where's our breakfast? And he doesn't know how to open the door because, first of all, he's a bug, and second of all, he realizes as a bug, it's going to be a problem. It's going to probably scare them a little bit, you know. And uh, and so eventually, when he's not coming out of the room, they're all mad at him. You know, they don't know if the bills are going to be paid. Everybody's freaking out. And the sister opens the door and sees her brother as a bug and flips out, gets a broom, tries to kill him. Uh, you know, it's like hitting him with this broom and he's like trying to explain in a squeaky little voice. You know, it's, it's like ee, 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 ee. And he starts climbing onto the ceiling and then she flips out because he's on the ceiling. And anyway, it just goes on like this. And he watches his whole family learn how to work. They start putting bread on the table. The sister's able to do X, Y, and Z. And he gets, and, and the metamorphosis gets into this whole story of how he begins to realize how he turned into a bug. It's, it's an amazing story. You really must read it. But like I said, you know, if you're going to go down the path of philosophy, you know, tread carefully, 
you know, a little bit of alternative substances like wine, or Diet Coke or something, you know, um, will not go astray. Anyway, so that means a change. Metamorphosis was a change. You woke up one day, it turned out to be a bug. Morphogenesis is not metamorphosis. Morphogenesis, if something morphs, it goes from something uh, that has a logical component, perhaps, that you could trace how it becomes X, Y, and Z. It, it, it goes in one direction, and then its direction feeds back and creates a, a sort of wider version of itself, and then it continues, and it feeds back. And, it can, and so there's, a, there's what's traditionally known as the famous feedback loop. And this is how artificial intelligence operates. So in the, um, with Alan Turing and Crowd, which we'll get into in a minute, the notion of how computers could learn, well, first of all, there was no notion. It was just like, if this, go that way. If, if yes, go there. If no, go there. If maybe, just sit there. So programming was a form of metamorphosis, whereas morphogenesis was actual learning. So, and here's the big leap in society right now. Robots, or bots, for those of you that want to sound like you're in this century, as opposed to in the last century. Phone is now. Sorry. It's, you know, ET going. Um, that in a morphogenic situation, if you have a bot and the bot is going in a direction and it hits a wall, it learns about the wall. It's able to import something so that eventually, not only will it not hit the wall, a, a better way of putting this is that it starts like crawling around. You'll see, we'll show, I'll show you a movie at some point. But it's crawling around like this and at some point it hits a wall and realizes that it can, if it stands up, it's not like it realizes, but in standing up, once it hits the wall, it's able to, to enlarge its, let's say, capacity to analyze problems, that's the feedback loop, and become something that can walk. And they've been able to, in the last uh, decade or so, come up with bots that can learn how to walk within 11 stages. So they can hit walls up to a certain point, and then like on the 11th or 12th stage, they can actually walk which is freaky, okay? And they're not that far away from uh, Alan Turing's famous question. You know the world has changed when the computer doesn't answer a question but ask you whether or not you want ice cream with a cherry on top. And it was a whole very famous question that when does the computer want ice cream with a cherry on top? How does it know? And for those of you that are Doctor Who fans, not the last one, who I thought was an idiot, the one beforehand, who was good looking and fun and had nice trainers, um, whatever his name was, David Tennant, yes. Uh, David Tennant gets caught, you didn't like him, David Tennant? I can't stand David Tennant, he just shouts. He's got a lovely Scottish accent, they make him English. Just... Anyway, do not destroy my image. <laughs> <laughs> David Tennant. Anyway, so, David Tennant is stuck, or Doctor Who, or Mr. Who, or Doctor Who is stuck in a boat, uh, a, a, a spacecraft with a bot. And he realizes the bot is this, in the form of this woman who is, she, he's, I don't know if you've seen this episode, I'm sure you have if you're obsessive. Have you seen it? I uh, have. <laughs> you have? I've yeah. seen it all. <laughs> well, where he's talking to this woman and he says something to her and she responds, but later, you know, so he says, you know, how are you? And oh, she yeah, says, that's um, how are you? Midnight. It's called Midnight? Yeah. Oh, great, because I'm going to find that. So then she's, I, yeah. so what happens eventually, he's saying something and she then says something and then he says it and then she says it. And eventually she catches up to him and then she says it before he says it. And then she says it before he even thinks it. And this is very much a morphogenic move. And they were, you know, it's great watching science fiction because they, they, they're able to bring in all this kind of, anyway. We'll get into that in a much bigger way. Okay, and then we get into the question of complexity. Now, complexity does not mean that it's complicated, okay? Complexity means that the layers of bundles, let's say light, intensity, move in directions, sorry, don't move in directions, move in dimensions. 
and form different plateaus because of it, because of this, this very different form of movement. And I will explain that in a much greater way. Um, we're going to get into that. We're going to get into uh, Isabel Stenger's uh, wild science. I put wild science, actually that's my term, but she does wild concepts. Um, anyway, and she's quite wonderful in her own way. She started out as a physicist and moved into philosophy. Um, so she's, uh, she's an interesting uh, uh, writer, philosopher, scientist. Karen Brad uh, wrote a book called um, Meeting the Universe Halfway. We'll be looking at that. And entanglement is one of these great words that you might learn to love. Like last year's, last semester's great word I thought was sublation. That was my favorite word. Did anybody have a favorite word? Nobody remembers last semester. Great. Mine is the teleological suspension of the ethical. I just love saying that. Yeah, no, the teleological suspension of the ethical. That was always quite a good one, too. Yeah. Anyway, this new one, entanglement, is a very specific notion of how quantum physics, op physics operates, which we'll get into. Um, and then there is QR, QR, QR is dimensionality, synthetic life, bio arts, memory, voice, imaging, gesture. Or maybe we'll do something else all together. So the, the key here, though, is take what you can. It's a big course. There is a, there is a thread to it. So those of you that are actually taking it for credit, fear not. You will be able to A, pass it, and B, get an A. OK, so it, it's not impossible. But you need to find out how your work latches on to this and, work, and then allow yourself to go on a little magic carpet ride. Okay, so that, that's what you need to make sure. Every week there will be a two hour plus, um, we'll start at 5.30, I, I used to start at 5.15. You can start moving in here at 5.15 and grabbing your space, but we will actually begin at 5.30 because I re realized that it was kind of crazy. People were coming at all different times last time. And we'll go from 5.30 to quarter to eight. And that is mainly because they close the building, otherwise we would go longer. Um, and if you're, if you're desperate, we can have a, a break. With the PhD students, we always have three hours on a break, but if you want children, small, little, lovely things, uh, you might need a little break, like a coffee break or a cigarette break for the addicts in the back. <laughs> yes. And the side. And the side. <laughs> and the surrounding us. Anyway, uh, so you might need a break. So don't, don't worry, we'll have a break. They're kicking us all out of America. Go somewhere. We have to smoke in other countries. <laughs> I know, I can see that. It's not just five meters anymore, or five feet for the building. It's now 5,000 miles. OK, great. OK, um, so it's about two, two and a half hour lecture. Uh, they will always follow the, uh, the lectures listed, unless they don't, in which case, um, what I mean by that, that sound right. what I meant is that let's say we get stuck on one of the things and it's not clear, I, just because it's week three and we should be X, if you're not there, then we're not going to go there until everybody can be kind of moved together. So it's kind of like one big, large, you know, <laughs> thing that's moving. Um, yeah. The uh, analytic book review is due on the 25th of February. Uh, and I'll go through the book list in a second. The essay can either be 3,500 words and no more than 5,000 words, properly footnoted, and I'm a real stickler for that. Um, and for those of you that have um, think this is crazy, the ones that did this AHRC PhD reference thing um, know just how crazy grant applications and other creatures out in the so-called real world are believe it or not, around footnotes and these kind of things. It, it just has to be done professionally. So might as well learn it now when it only matters about a grade and not your salary or you know, you know, losing your organ or something. OK, um, now, there will be a set of questions that will be handed out for that essay. And they'll be handed out on the day that your essays are due, your analytic book reviews are due in. You are also welcome to submit a piece of artwork and a smaller essay. Because I want to start getting into peop into the idea, if you want to do practice-based PhDs, that you get a sense of how to do this in these kind of environments. So, um, and again, it's a tougher one, because the piece of work and the essay question are the same thing. They're not, one's not describing the other, the other's not describing the other. They are saying the same thing. One is saying it in one medium, and the other is saying it in another medium. 
So it's like doing the work twice. So I hope I've like made you want to do that. Rush out, do it. Okay. Um, all books, chapters, and so on are available either online or photocopied or linked to Dropbox or Google Plus, etc. And I said and or Moodle, but that's a lie because they will never put a, unless somebody in this class wants to take that up as a, as a sport and put it on Moodle, that's fine with me. Um, okay, maps, MP3s. Uh -huh. Okay, and now if you go to that website, www.cfar-biad.co.uk, um, you will find under P, I think it is for podcast. It's podcast on the sidebar. Okay, it's podcast on the sidebar. Um, and if you go there, you can find the um, the, the lecture uh, that happened. I don't know, how long does it take you to put them up? About a day or so? Um, it's usually four or five days. Four or five days. So like, it, they lag behind by about half a, half a week. Unless you want to pester him and then, you know. Yeah, go as fast as the computer. Yeah, only, but or just give him presents. You know, I mean, there are ways. You know, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Did you say you need a computer? No, no. <laughs> it's, okay. it's just a bit, a bit clunky. Seriously, because as the we can get you a computer if that's what's slowing it up. Okay, ask Nick. Yeah. Or ask Gr Grace um, whether or not it's the computer or it's the. Um, it's got, it's got a line of dodgy computers. No, she, she's got a line of dodgy computers. She has, she has one of the computers, so she's a she's a CFAR researcher. Um, so we have an extra one. That's what I'm asking. So if you need it, then you can have it for the duration of this, if that's what the problem is. Okay. You know, now this one says the difference between America and England. If I were saying this to someone in the U.S., <laughs> in New York, they'd go, yeah, okay, what level is it? Oh, it's a Mac Pro. Not good enough. Here, yeah. on the other hand, we have someone going, right, I'm okay with my 1937. <laughs> okay, essential readings. Essential readings, I did originally have it as uh, required readings, but actually it's more essential in the sense that depending, now notice there's like five hundred readings here. You're not expected to do all the reading. What you're expected to do is figure out, as a, a young scholar, what's important for what you need to do. In this pool are your essential readings, okay? When you're thinking through your work, go look at this, and you'll see what, you know, some are more essential than others, but they're all essential. Um, so I'm just going to go through these very quickly. Kathy Acker uh, is, or was a novelist, a uh, very interesting writer. Uh, her book, Pussy, King of the Pirates, is very similar in style to Deleuze's work and Blanchot's work. To Deleuze and Guattari's work, A Thousand Plateaus, and Blanchot's work, pardon me, Infinite Conversation, except this is more pornographic. Theirs was not quite as pornographic. Hence, we have this one on the list. Uh, her book, her uh, piece called Lust, A Sailor's Slight Identity, very interesting piece, um, going in and out of um, what it is to have different body forms as one form. Uh, and it's in a book called Seven Deadly Sins. Uh, Karen Brad, I've mentioned her a couple times, Meaning the Universe Half uh, Way, Quantum Physics and the Entanglement of Matter and Meaning. Uh, I think the whole book is actually on PDF right now. Yeah, yeah. the caveat and stuff I couldn't find a copy of so. Oh, I've got it in there. So, mm -hmm. just go on some okay. Yeah. Um, Deleuze Guattari, a new cartographer in Foucault, in his book called Foucault, um, this is to get you into the uh, notion of how um, a method is like a map, um, by which is meant not that you know where you're going, but that you're on a journey, and that the journey has the kind of way a map might have if you didn't really know where you're going, but you're kind of following kind of some sort of path. And so Deleuze gets into this whole question of cartography <coughs> as a method. Um, what is philosophy really shouldn't have been in this essential thing, should have been in the interesting one. Uh, Einstein, obviously this is important, relativity the special general theory. Now anything by Roger Penrose in the sciences, you should read if you're interested, if your way into things is through the science thing. He's very readable and he's fantastic. There's another guy that's actually equally interesting named um, Lee Smolin, 
S M O L I N. Uh, pretty much anything he writes is very good too. Time Reborn. For those of you interested in doing stuff on time, good. Um, let's see. Foucault, Technology of the Self, very important. Uh, Care of the Self uh, in the History of Sexuality, Volume 3. And then I just thought I'd just list a whole bunch of other things. So, because it, it was taking up too much space, so I put them all together. Just <coughs> do that in your references. Sorry. Um, but Disciplines and the Sciences of the Individual, Biopower, Sex and Truth, Practices um, and Sciences of the Self. These are all part of his, the Foucault Reader. It's in uh, Rabineau, editor. Um, there's Felix Guattari, Chaosmosis, an Ethical Aesthetic Paradigm. That may be of use for you. Um, Donna Haraway, When Species Meet. Now this is for those of you that are questioning um, the, the, the use of identity and not just between men, women, and men and women and trans, but uh, animals and any living environment, any living um, sentient being. And it's quite an interesting work. Her original stuff started out in cyborg. Uh, she was looking at cyborg uh, relationships and she's moved into this other thing. And she's, she's actually uh, quite a dog person. She has two dogs. I think one, either she's got one dog called Cayenne, Cayenne Pepper or the two dogs, one called Cayenne and the other one's called Pepper. I can't remember now. Uh, but anyway. She and has a total dog person. She's a total she dog person. She writes endlessly. Yeah. Like yeah. It's true. Animals. All right. <laughs> Try not to. No, her father was a something. Was a dog. Sport. <laughs> <laughs> he was a sports writer, wasn't he? She I don't writes, know. Yeah, because she writes about it a lot in companions' pieces. Yeah. And then she got, she raced dogs. She writes about it. Anyway, so one species meet. Okay. Uh, part of the Post Humanities Press. There's another person named Carrie Wolf. C A R Y Wolf. And Carrie Wolf. Um, is interesting uh, because, well, he runs Post Humanities Press, but a lot of the work he does, he's opened up the field on the question of this thing called Post Humanities, as that's not really part of the course. I can put it down here, but that's not that interesting. Martin Heidegger will be one of the uh, more essential than others type of thing, because his work, Identity and Difference, will be very useful for you, I hope. Very complex, but uh, the question concerning technology and other essays. Um, the one that's done, the one that's been edited and introduced by William Lovett is the one you want, which is also on uh, Dropbox, as is identity and difference. Irigare, Lucy, L U C E, Lucy Irigare, The Forgetting of Air and Heidegger. She's a complicated feminist. Um, she was a Lacanian. Uh, she was studying with Lacan in, uh, in the university with him and got into such a heated argument with him about his misogynistic ways of posing female body and so on and so forth, that she either left or got kicked out or both. Um, and then she wrote, her, a lot of her work is basically a parallel discussion of Lacan. So the speculum of the other is sort of a, in relationship to the real and the imaginary and so on. And if you read her work, you'll see that she's doing this kind of parallel move with Lacan, but she doesn't get seen and Lacan does and I think you'd figure that one out. She's a bit of a handful, Lucia de Gade. I mean, uh, she does tend to get into very, she's alive, she gets into very angry moods with people, especially if they don't translate her language correctly from English to French, which I can sort of understand, but um, you don't really want to cross her in the dark alley or even the lit one. Okay, uh, then there's Jean-Francois uh, Leotard, L-Y-O, not L-E, not like it's the thing you wear, but, okay. Um, Discourse Figure is uh, one of the least known books of his. Probably the most known is Libidinally, actually the most known is um, the Postmodern Condition. That was the most known. He's the one that coined the term postmodern and postmodernism. Um, I've taught this course so many different ways that I've actually left that off, it's hilarious. Okay, but, um, and he's got this very interesting book called Postmodernism Explained to Children. See, you know, because he got very, and the children he's referring to are not little children, they're the faculty members that he can't stand. And you'll find that a lot of these philosophers have this kind of like, they, have, they write what I call your fuck you books, you know, and I just like, just hate. You know, the libidinal economy is his major, you know, I hate all of you, I hate everyone, I hate your mother, you know, um, anyway, um, but it's a great book. Um, 
a little bit of Lake Hanami, where we're going to be looking at the tensor, the tensor band. Um, then there's Nietzsche, Eke Homo, how one becomes what one is. That's the key here, is the, the subtitle, how one becomes what one is, which is slightly different than this question of telos. And I'll swing back onto that. That's a very fun book to, uh, a very fun but very complex book to do a book review on. He's got chapters in there like, why am I so wise? And why I write such great books. <laughs> I love Nietzsche. <laughs> it just continues, you know. How is it that I've had to live pearls among swine? You know, anyway, so he's, he's just great. Uh, then there's George Macunius, uh, who wrote the Fluxus Manifesto. Um, and Fluxus is a very important movement um, that you may or may not have ever heard of. I assume you have heard of it. Um, we'll get into that a little bit, and we'll get into today if we have time. Um, John Mowat. Now, I put down his gold bug, which is the forward to John Francois Leotard's discourse figure, because in here, if you can get through the, if you can wade through the treacle of philosophic uh, tough writing, you'll find that what he's basically saying is that we have to get beyond a dialectic, and that Leotard's doing that. That's what he basically is saying. Okay, but he says it in a very poetic way uh, that may drive you to distraction. Um, but his other work, if you look up John Mowat, he does a lot of stuff on music, and he has a lot of stuff on drums and skin and sound and resonance and, and that kind of thing. So he might be interesting just on that level alone. Um, then Rubenstein, myself, and Fisher on uh, the verge of photography. In there is a piece by uh, Daniel that I'm having you guys read. Well, the book itself is interesting. There's another piece in there by, um, oh, God. She hit my, her name's went on my head for a second. Uh, anyway, she works on surveillance, which somebody might want to work on. Um, Isabel St <clears throat> Stengers, I've mentioned, uh, Thinking with Whitehead. And she also does a book called Cosmopolitics, which is uh, in the other section. And Alan Turing, uh, Can Machines Think? It's online. OK, readings that are important. So you could live without them in this course, but you know you don't have to. And if you have you know, all time in the world, or you want to take this course over a four year period, um, then you can do all of this. You can also take your book review from either one of these lists. The first one is by uh, Anonymous, uh, 14th century, The Cloud of Unknowing. Let's see, I put that twice. Um, for me, this is one of the most amazing pieces of work I've come across in a very, very long time. I came across it about a decade ago. And um, I think that it still resonates today, but uh, you'll have to take a look at it. It's written by, they think, a monk. But they actually don't know who wrote it. And it's um, basically questioning God but doing it in a way that makes you actually think of cloud computing. I mean, obviously, whoever was writing this was not writing about cloud computing, but you can actually think about it in these terms, and it's, it's very weird if you start shape-shifting while you're reading. Um, then there's the Bohr-Einstein debates, uh, number 2627, which is online. It's just, that's just a summary of it. Um, there's BBC Chaos, Fractals, and Dynamics, which is a fantastic video link, uh, which I'll put on uh, so you can see it. Um, Gregory Chaitin I, is one of my all-time favorite readable people on if you're into math and don't really want to study it. Um, he's, well, you can obviously read his harder work, but thinking about Gödel and Turing, essays on complexity, really fantastic work. This is on the thing. Manuel de Landa, in, uh, Intensive Science and Virtual Philosophy, A Thousand Years of Nonlinear History. And he wrote another one that's very famous. I don't remember what it was. Simulation. Yeah, simulation. Simulation of synthetic reason. Yeah, what's, what's it called? Simulation of what? Emergence of synthetic yeah. reason. Yeah, and emergence of synthetic reason. Just, you know, want to rush right out and buy three copies. Uh, but he's very interesting as well. A Thousand Years of Nonlinear History catapulted him into fame. A um, bit of an arrogant guy, but very interesting, nevertheless. Um, <coughs> let's see. Then there's uh, Gilles Deleuze, The Logic of Sense. Now, this book is based on Alice in Wonderland. Um, it kind of goes overboard a little bit with it. Uh, I mean, see what you think. I, I love this work, but it's taken me about 15 years to really be able to begin to read it. So, hence on page two. 
Uh, Duchamp, very important. The Complete Works of Marcel, du Marcel Duchamp. If you haven't read it, dipped in it, looked at it, then shame on you and go do it. Um, I don't recommend necessarily you doing your book review on it, uh, but you could uh, you'd go slightly mad because uh, it's only like 6,000 words, pages long. Kurt Gödel, on formally undecidable propositions of Principia, Mathematica, and related systems, I don't have a heart attack. What he's basically saying here is every system, no matter how simple, so including math, including arithmetic, one plus one is two, might seem like it's very causal or very deterministic, but in fact is undecidable. In fact, it's not that one has just guessed that we're just gonna pick this thing and call it one and pick this thing and call it another one and take it together and make it two, but we could have taken these things and called it one. No, he's saying that actually one, one plus one is also undecidable. And you need to learn eventually what this word, decidable, undecidable, which seems to start creeping up a lot what it means, and he, he changed the face of uh, com computing as we know it from, the, from about the 50s onwards, but he really became very famous in the, in the 60s. Um, so it's important that you take a, that you just sort of open the page and look, look at it, you know, like, you know, like you're something with the devil with a long spoon, except for those of you that really like it, and then you'll totally get into it. Um, okay. Uh, oh, then I've got some of my work, uh, put it on the second page, the ninth technology of otherness. Um, Animaterialism will come in handy. These are just background things you can get a sense if you want to uh, sort of cliff notes of what we're doing. Uh, fractal philosophy and the small matter of learning how to listen. Um, and, uh, and that I think is all I put down for that one. Yeah. Okay, and then there's, uh, there's the eight technologies of otherness I left off my book. Anyway, whatever. Um, but you'll, you'll come across it if you just go look them up. They're all on academia.edu, but also they'll be on the Dropbox. Heidegger, um, Contributions to Philosophy, very difficult. I don't recommend you looking at this except to torture yourself. Um, but what is called thinking, that you could look at. It just so happens that it's an earlier thing, which is why it's second. Notice how the, uh, these are done, by the way. Last name, first, comma, first name or first initial, full stop, then the time when the book was made, full stop, then the title, full stop, so on and so forth. That's not the same as, as footnotes. And you don't number them, you put them in alphabetical order from the most recent version, like Heidegger 2012, and then Heidegger 1976, put that one first. And then one second. Okay. Hofstadter, oh, I didn't put the whole book down, that's hilarious. Okay, it's called uh, Gödel Escher Bach, what's it, the braid it's thing? Eternal Golden Braid. An Eternal Golden Braid, sorry, see, honestly, Dane. <laughs> this is my. This is his field. thesis, basically. This is, <laughs> this is his field. field. Got to get out more, Dean. No, I <laughs> Just saying. Uh, anyway, it's a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful book. It's very uh, readable. One of my favorite works is by Lucy Lippard. Lippard. Uh, six years. Now, this is the title. Six years. The, de the dematerialization of the art object from 1966 to 72. A cross-reference book on some aesthetic boundaries consisting of a bibliography into which are inserted a fragmented text, artworks, interviews, and symposia, arranged chronologically and focused on so-called conceptual or information or idea art with mentions of such vaguely designated areas as minimal, anti-form, systems, earth, or processes, art occurring now in America's Europe, England, Africa, and Asia with occasional political overtones. <laughs> I just thought, in she wrote this in, well, it says 2009, but I think she wrote it in 1966 when it first came out, or 19, would have been 75 or something. It is unbelievable that she could come up with this then, and now people are just now hearing what she's saying. Can you imagine, it's like spitting in the wind or something, it's like really being ahead of your time. Okay, Leotard, uh, Jean-Francois, Leotard, The Assassination of Experience by Painting. Very interesting, very interesting. He's basically saying um, that, uh, as all of them are say, saying, how do you know when you're right? Well, just because you've experienced it doesn't mean that experience is the only teacher or even the best teacher. Experience teaches you one thing, and that's that it teaches you nothing. That's his position. And that painting is able to show how that's the case. 
and it's a very complex but very interesting uh, piece that he did. Uh, I think we've got that on Dropbox. Oh, okay. I'll bring a copy then. Because uh, we'll put it. In, I think I've got a copy in the library then. Okay, I'll find it. Uh, Lessons on the analytic of the Don't try it at home. Um, it's a tough one. It's all on Kant. Unless you're in, unless you're a philosopher and you're really into getting into the Kantian side of these questions, leave that one till your second year or your first year of your PhD. Um, I just have it there so you know it exists. Friedrich Nietzsche, the genealogy of morals. Now, the Kaufman translation, and also you see here I have Eki Homo, the Kaufman tra translation here, whereas I put the other translation, um, uh, I can't remember his name now, um, on the other page. Um, the translations are very interesting because uh, they can bring out totally different reads of what the same book is. Anyone whose language is not primarily English or first English, you know how complicated and how annoying bad translations can be. Um, so you have to be very careful. I just want to put your, uh, so give you a sense of it. Now, as you may know, Nietzsche went mad um, and was put in a sanatorium. He went mad because he had syphilis and eventually it went to his uh, brain and killed him. But when he was in um, the sanitarium, he wrote um, Ecce Homo. He wrote it just before he went in. And then he wrote uh, another book called My Sister and I. And there's big controversy as to whether or not he really wrote this or this is a hoax. And so the first 100 pages of this book is the discussion, My Sister and I, the discussion on whether or not it's a hoax. And Walter Kaufman, who's quite a conservative guy, was livid that this got out, as did the sister, because the whole thing is about how uh, Nietzsche was in love with his sister and had sexual relationships with her. There's pictures in there with her dressed with whips and you know and whipping him and stuff like this. So if you're not busy one night, you might want to just check it out. My sister and I. Um, I think it's an amazing book on the question of the hoax and whether or not it's true or not, and who cares on one level because it's so it so um, parallels Ecce Homo, and it's so clever in that same why am I so wise type of way that I'm curious, I didn't put it down here only because I forgot, um, not because I meant to leave it off, but my sister and I, um, you could do a review on that. Um, where are we? Shaviro, Stephen Shaviro, Without Criteria, very useful resource book, actually. So if you need like kind of a, a marker to help you through this, that's a helpful one. Uh, Isabel Stanger's Cosmopolitics, uh, I think there's three volumes now, there's at least two. Um, the Format Brothers, Fantastic! Look at this. Uh, look at their uh, website. I'm going to send you this, by the way, so you'll have it online. So you just click it. Uh, to send you the outline. Um, the Format Brothers. I met them in Japan, and uh, they came up with a um, a type of philosophy. They're working on a type of philosophy uh, art called Rakugaku, and Rakugaku is just wild stuff of uh, basically uh, acoustic works of art meeting. Uh, uh, kind of phonetic uh, philosophy and phonology. You'll see when you get when you take a look at this. Uh, and then finally, Wittgenstein lectures on the foundations of mathematics. He he gave these lectures in 1939, which is a very auspicious year. And um, they get into questions of between Alan Turing, who was a student in the class, and uh, Einstein and Susan. Okay, any questions on that so far? Sorry, it's taking a little longer than I thought. Good. Okay. Now we'll just go through this. There are 10 weeks in this course. There may be more if you want them. There may be less if something happens. But generally speaking, there are these 10. Um, I'm going to hopefully say a few words about fluxes in a minute. But um, so the first one is this week, no reading, uh, just for you to get a sense, just hear what's going on, just, just move from where you've been, you know, sort of like. You know, we're doing a little exercising here. Um, now, next week is when it really starts. When it gets, you know, you'll learn about this thing called techna. What it means to say techna. What it means to do techna. Um, and this is uh, getting into. Uh, eventually, you'll see that it's getting into um, the Heideggerian notion of technology, which is 
technology. Technology. So technology is ology is always the logic of something. So socio sociology, logic of the socio, you know, psychology, logic of the psyche, technology, logic of the techna. Okay, so it gives you a sense of where we're gonna go with that. Um, and so the very first thing though is I want you to get a sense of Foucault's agenda of of breaking with um, of define maps. So we're going to look at um, the anti-fascist uh, notes on how to become an anti-fascist, basically. Um, and then we'll start the question concerning technology. Um, and it is, I thought I seen one. Oh, no, I lost the page, I'm sorry. Week three. Okay, so we. No, it's not about. It's just okay. What you need to read in the question concerning technology is this essay called "The Question Concerning Technology," which is in the book called "The Question Concerning Technology and Other Essays." Forget as above seminar one. I was trying to make sure that you could see it, but I can see that it's actually readable. Week three um, difference. So the first one begins to. Wait a second. We've got an error. We have an error here, people. Week three, I don't know what happened here. Um, that's wrong, week three is wrong. Just cross that out, this is wrong. <laughs> and I'll have to fix that. Um, it should be on um, the question, it should be about poetics and the question of how techna is a, is a question of art, sorry. Um, I'll, I'll fix that, I don't know what, what happened there. It's just a, a wrong cut and paste. Week four, uh, it gets into the question of belonging, and we get into the question of identity, um, and identity and difference, and this question of Dasein. So the, the, the hinge seminar, which is not there, week three, it gets into moot, so there's words like Dasein and, um, and techno become more uh, obvious, standing reserve, this kind of thing. That, that's gonna be in week three. Week four, we'll get into this question of belonging, and you'll be looking at identity and difference of Heidegger, and um, and basically his question of identity, and what this thing called A equals A is all about. And then we get into the question of belonging, um, again, as a feature of identity, and non-belonging, and anti-belonging, and A-belonging, and Anna-belonging, all these kind of things. Um, and we'll go back to this question of identity um, indifference, but uh, this time we'll also get into this question of difference and, t and entanglement. So, you're, so it's going to have a little bit of a, um, a swelling going on here. Uh, in other words, basically going to take two weeks on the word identity. Then we're going to get into the word difference of identity and difference. Uh, you'll learn about things like perdurance and event appropriation. Then uh, week seven, we have another form of difference that now difference becomes intensities and patterns and relativities. And here we start moving into the question of the rhizome, which you'll learn what that is with Deleuze. It'll be um, caught in the text of Einstein and Leotard. And you'll be looking at the format brothers there. Week eight is going to, oh, and your essays do, uh, the book review is due on the 25th. Then the um, then on week eight is the tensor band, and it gets into undecidabilities, which I was talking about earlier. Week nine, it gets into complexity, uh, as opposed to undecidability, but they linked. Week 10, we get into time, space, and quantum physics, and the Higgs boson. And we could go further. I, I don't know how long the seminar goes. I, I don't know how long these things go. I think they're 10 weeks, but they could be 13 weeks. Does anybody know? I know there's a break somewhere in here um, at the end of the month. And I think it's the last week of March, right, yeah. is the break. Yeah. And I think when you come back, do you have any more classes, or is that it? Yeah, that's OK, it. so then that's it. If you want to have one or two more classes, we can at least have one more, just for old time's sake, if you feel like you need to have another discussion. And I don't know when the papers are due, because last time I handed in a date for when they were due, and I was wrong, and um, Henry, our leader, 
blamed me, I put the wrong date down. And since I don't know what the right date is for when it's due, I'm not putting down a date. Okay. So that nobody can say, I handed it in given the date that you said because on your paper. And, uh, okay, so I don't know what date it is. I think it's sooner than you put, but I'm going to do it really. End of term three years. I think it's the 22nd of April. Okay, so it's yeah. way sooner than that. It's just after the break. It's 22nd of April. Yeah. So. Yeah. So y'all do know. <laughs> Never. Okay, so let's just say, let's just say the 22nd of April, just as a flying leap. Or slash the end of term. <laughs> no, don't do that because I already got in trouble once about this. Okay, um, so as I say at the end here, you know, look, it's a tough class. If you have questions, don't feel bad about asking them. You know, the worst that happens is that people laugh and point at you. You know, that can't be that bad. You know, seriously, there, there's nothing wrong with asking a question to, to try to try and get into the nitty gritty of this. Bring your work in. You know, it's this is why we have a table. It'll be a little bit more cleaned up, so you can actually throw your work on the table if you want. Um, and always read something before the class. I mean, something that's on the course before you come in, because it will help you hear better. That's, that's, if you've just done a little bit of reading, I'm not expecting you to do, like give presentations. Um, we're not doing that kind of class. If you can just hear it, that would be great. But you, in order to hear it, you have to learn how to listen, and learning, or learning how to hear. And to do that, you need to do a little bit of exercises before you go in. Okay, um, and like I say, most importantly, have fun with this. I know it sounds crazy to have fun with physics, but it's possible. Okay, any questions? Exhausted? <laughs> Ready to rock and roll? Okay, so, all right, that's it. That, that's it, bye. <laughs> okay. Do I have to, did everybody sign a piece of paper? Okay. Did everybody sign a piece of paper? You didn't. Can you just pass that?
that. But also, so the second time around, seeing that you're not taking this to, to get when a mark, I see you, in you can actually listen. Can I ask you for yes. Whereas the next time, <laughs> you, you just can check that. Can you? Sure, I don't. Or <laughs> yeah. you have to really do the, the work. And I can just give it to you. Yeah, yeah. 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 because yeah. even yeah. Yeah. I would like to have that for myself. Yeah, that was doing the same. I mean, if you're sitting in. No, 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 no. You're only doing the reading. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To stay or leave, or for Natalia, as a survivor of this environment. I don't know what I like to see.